Okay, so hello and uh, welcome to our virtual audience joining us today to discuss the upcoming Lebanese parliamentary elections. Today's event is organized by the Arab Studies Institute in collaboration with the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship at the American University of Beirut in collaboration also with Notre Dame University, Louise and DU. This project is part of a, uh, or this event is part of a big project co-sponsored by around 17 research institutions. First, allow me to welcome our distinguished panelists for today that I will be introducing in a moment. My name is Maria Bouzid. I am an associate professor and the chairperson of the Media Studies Department at NDU. And I'm also the executive director of the Arab Studies Institute Beirut office. I will be hosting this panel that is addressing mainly, as the title indicates, the Lebanese parliamentary elections that should be held potentially next May amid a combination of financial, political, and social crises. In fact, these elections feed the hope for change to save the country from its profound, from its pro profound economic recession and political failure. To explore these ideas and hopes, we are joined by our esteemed speakers from different fields that I will be introducing by order of speaking appearance. Lina Abu Habib, Ms. Abu Habib is the director of the Asfari Institute and an expert in mainstreaming gender in development policies and practices and in building capacities for gender mainstreaming in regional and international agencies, as well as public institutions. She was a senior policy fellow at the Hissam Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut. Dr. Kamal Abushdid. Dr. Kamal Abushdid is the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at Notre Dame University Louise in Lebanon and faculty member in the rank of professor. He is also a member of the Lebanese Association for Educational Studies. He has many publications in specialized journals, as well as book chapters and reports tackling different topics, including youth in marginalized settings. Dr. Christy Modi. Dr. Modi holds a PhD in communication from Carleton University in Canada, and she is currently an assistant professor of media studies at Notre Dame University. Dr. Modi's research interests are mainly focused on pan-Arab media, journalism, and the inter intersection of media with the various social, sociopolitical, cultural, labor, and legal aspects of gender and sexuality. Then we have Mr. Nadim al Kalk, who is a Beirut-based researcher, freelance writer, and postgraduate student. He works at the Policy uh, Initiative, which is a new think tank, new local think tank, where he leads research projects on Lebanon's growing landscape of anti-establishment actors. His academic research examines the tensions between counter-revolution, neoliberal ideology, and radical political imaginaries in Lebanon's uprisings. Our esteemed discussant for today is Dr. Hatim El Hibri, who is an assistant professor of film and media studies. His research and teaching interests focus on global and transnational media, visual cultural studies in Lebanon and the Middle East, and media theory and history. His first book, titled Visions of Beirut, The Urban Life of Media Infra Infrastructure, was out in 2021 and was a real success. So, I will give the floor right now to, uh, to Ms. Lina, and uh, I will be uh, giving somehow each speaker eight to 10 minutes so that later on we can open the floor for discussion. And I would like to remind also our audience that we will be taking all the questions from the Facebook comments section. So Ms. Abi Habib, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for this opportunity. It's always wonderful to collaborate, the collaboration between um, um, ASI and the Asfari Institute is really at the core of our priorities. So thank you uh, for being here. I, um, um, of course, I'm not a specialist in elections, but what I want to talk about is, given the upcoming elections, I'm going to talk about something which is at the heart of our concerns, which is the uh, the, the representation of uh, of women. 
Uh, and I'm not going to uh, emphasize um, simply independent women, but women as a whole uh, in, in our parliament. And of course, it's no secret to anyone that we have been, this country has been notoriously low uh, in the representation of uh, of women, probably one of the lowest in the region, and the region is our region in terms of women's political participation is one of the lowest worldwide. So we can see where we are uh, at the bottom uh, at the bottom of the heap. Um, I just want to remind us that if you look at the municipal elections, at least the last two that happened, we. Um, uh, the regime has flaunted the fact that uh, the representation of women doubled. Of course, it doubled from two to four percent, uh, which uh, you know um, uh, I'm not even mentioning the fractions because we do know that even from two to four, it's really immaterial. And there are a number of significant uh, structural barriers that would not allow women to uh, um, to engage go through the process and then win at the local level, particularly, uh, you know, the, 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 the family uh, structure, the kind of clanic system, uh, the importance of male headed household and the importance of male headed household in terms of deciding who will be the zaim, who will be who will be the leader. In this uh, in these particular uh, uh, elections, uh, we cannot but note that we do have 150 candidates. Uh, 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 it's still less than, way less than 10%. We, uh, I'm not a quantoid. I'm, uh, I, 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 uh, you know, I don't engage much with numbers. But in this case, um, it is significant. The, um, uh, a jump to 150 candidates, who, and there were four who were considering uh, considering uh, uh, presenting the candidacy, but at what we have now is 150 candidates. So what are the issues uh, at present? Uh, one of the things is that uh, uh, overwhelmingly, the women candidates are overwhelmingly independent, uh, which, um, which, is an, which is indicative uh, of the, the 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 patriarchal nature of the political our you know the political parties in place, which can't even uh, allow their own women uh, to become uh, to become leader. It's really hilarious. It's really hilarious. Right. But having said this, uh, um, I know there's a lot of um, Jews not out on uh, unfortunately on the importance of at least changing the change of in politics uh, we, we have seen in the we have seen in the cabinet that you can have change backward from uh, six women to one woman. Yes, there is the argument these six women did not represent women, etc. But at this stage, we're only looking at who are allowed are women allowed allowed in and under which uh, uh, under which uh, conditions and with which uh, uh, comp compromises that interesting to say that um, uh, um, this pool of of women are actually many are are actually active in the public domain in different uh, in different arena in you know in environment civil society uh, civic activism, but also feminist. And today I was listening to um, uh, to Zoya Rohana, a friend and a colleague and uh, uh, a well-known feminist who has been at the forefront of the whole fight in this country so that we had uh, a law um, which still leave enough a lot to be desired, but to protect women from domestic violence. And I thought, you know, uh, uh, Zoya's, uh, uh, Zoya's uh, discourse shifted um, in a very positive way. You know, the discourse of the feminist movement vis-a-vis -vis what needs reform was incredibly shy when it came to uh, family laws. Uh, and, and I remember very well the anger when I was in the young generation, the demand for an optional uh, was seen in terms of the corruption of the clergy and the, uh, and the corruption of the religious uh, regime and how interconnected it is, the incestuous relation with the political regime. Actually, what I will be working with in, in parliament is going to be 
uh, a compulsory civil family law. So, and I really like that because I think it's a lesson learned vis-a-vis uh, -vis this regime that um, that um, uh, ineffectual, uh, ridiculous uh, strategy of let's pace our demands and let's go step by step, we have learned Um, was incredibly uh, uh, was incredibly vocal. I've also heard uh, Najat Saliba, our colleague uh, 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 at AUB, being incredibly also specific with um, uh, with a program that uh, that addresses her lifelong career in environmental conservation, but also focusing on women as citizens and women as uh, a carrier of knowledge and women as responsible for. Uh, resources management for rational management. And so, which takes me, so what is happening uh, for women? So on one hand, I think these last decade, and I wouldn't say the last two years, but actually the last decade has helped crystallize the crystallize, strengthen, and make the discourse, the narrative of the feminist movement more bolder, more open, more direct, without kind of, you know, let's try to play with it, let's try to flirt with the regime and see if we get uh, uh, our way. And number two, it's we're not going to get our way until we reclaim uh, that the, we reclaim that parliament. And this is what I'm what I'm seeing now. Again, we might say, what is 150? Uh, it's less than 10%, but nevertheless, these are 150 women who actually uh, um, uh, went through the whole process. And this process, and maybe I will, um, and this is where I want to, want to, and this process is completely different when it comes to women than for other people. We have, um, uh, the, the elephant in the room is the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the particular violence against women in any uh, political role. It doesn't matter whether we approve them, or whether we agree with them or not. The political, the sexual violence is incredibly abusive in the case uh, uh, of women. And it is shared by everybody. The harassment, uh, um, what's happening, it's okay. Sorry, something happened. You know, harassment, slurs, uh, uh, um, um, disparaging somebody's reputation, character assassination. When it comes to women, it's always about uh, it's always about you know characterizing women in politics as being loose. Uh, the usual. I don't. I, I really don't have to tell you. And it's it's uh, it's sad that this is what we, these are. Uh, this is what we have to deal with in 2022. But this is what the regime is like. This is a patriarchal regime, is a regime that is go uh, going to undermine women because they are women. And, and what we are seeing, for instance, is the truly obnoxious intimidation and bullying of one of the independent candidates, Nahida Khalil, on the basis of the sexual identity of, uh, of, her, uh, of her daughter, who is a queer comedian, uh, um, as, we, as, we all know, as, we, as we all know. Um, so, so on the one hand, you know, there is this, uh, uh, this um, um, sectarian system that we all, we all know of, and Zoya Rohana was saying this, uh, this morning that how much she wished she wouldn't be presenting herself as a candidate for the Greek Orthodox seat in, in the Shuf. Uh, um, but right after that, saying that this is what she what this is what she pledges to work against, um, we, you know. So on the world, you have this, this patriarchal system, which which uh, which is in cahoots with the patriarchal, uh, also uh, 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 oppressive regime, which can only um, which can only work together to make sure that vocal women, feminist women, women with an agenda for change, women who will not, uh, uh, women who will say no to the to the religious system, uh, you know, uh, will not will not be there in, in parliament. So what we want is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking this from home and I'm a cat person. So what we want in, what they want in parliament are the docile uh, women, those who speak on behalf of husbands and whether alive or dead, those who speaks or speak on behalf of brothers, whether alive or dead, 
rather than somebody coming and telling you, you know, uh, um, um, uh, this is not working and actually we want a civil uh, family law. And what I want to say is, um, 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 you know, just conclude with a, with, with a comment from, from my perspective uh, in terms of uh, women's, women's political participation in Lebanon. Uh, in the last 10 years, we have seen scandal after scandal after scandal coming out from the clergy. And all of these scandals relate to women, relate to abuse, to sexual abuse, relate to all forms of, uh, of corruption. These scandals uh, and these forms of abuses have actually touched women across the board, uh, across the social economic divide, across the religious divide and the sectarian divide. For, for, for this to change, it needs women to be in parliament. And most of the independent women that we know of uh, and with whom we've, you know, one has had conversation know that this is what they will be bringing to the table. And I think that would be entry point for breaking down uh, uh, the system, which requires, you know, we, as feminine, um, uh, uh, patriarchy poses on three pillars, religion and its institution, military and the military and, the, and its institutions, and capitalism and its, uh, and its institutions, which, you know, are, again, connected, implicated, it's, it's yet another incestuous, uh, yet another incestuous uh, relationship. But, um, I'm fairly, fairly confident that this is what these women uh, are, this is what they will bring to the table. Hence, all these uh, uh, obnoxious attempts to stop them from getting into parliament. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Abi Habib. Uh, this is somehow a good start with the gender lens that is close to all our to our hearts. Uh, so I will move to uh, Dr. Abu Shdid, who is going to uh, take us to citizenship, to education, and to a totally different lens. Dr. Abu Shdid, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you uh, very much for the uh, invitation. And uh, as uh, Ms. Habib, I'm not uh, a specialist in elections, uh, but I'm going to approach it from the prism of education and societal uh, uh, factors. Uh, the, uh, the presentation uh, will uh, shed light on, uh, on two situational antecedents and one dispositional uh, factor uh, in relation to the voting behavior in the forthcoming elections. For the uh, societal, uh, for the contextual uh, or situational, uh, I'm going to talk about education and societal factors. Under education, there will be three uh, main uh, issues that I would like to shed light uh, on and under societal, there will be one issue that I'm going to emphasize. Now, uh, regarding the educational uh, dimension, um, I would say that uh, it is commonplace knowledge, uh, nothing new except to uh, reveal uh, some of the issues that are pressing in Lebanon with regards to education. However, under the societal issue, there is some emphasis on new original ideas that uh, have been uh, reported based on a comprehensive focus group study uh, on uh, populations in marginalized uh, areas in Lebanon. Uh, I'm talking about the youth. Now, uh, concerning the educational issues, I would like to start by uh, emphasizing the fact that Lebanon suffers uh, from the uh, content-based curriculum that is, uh, uh, that is uh, focused on uh, the uh, teacher, the content, the material, instead of engaging students in critical thinking skills and the 21st century competences. Uh, also, students under the content-based curriculum are bereft from, uh, from engaging in uh, communal action and uh, deriving lessons and themes from their engagement in critical thinking and problem solving 
situations. Uh, so uh, one of the indicators, uh, immediate indicators for the failure of the educational system in Lebanon can be seen from the international uh, assessment tests that Lebanon participated in, such as TIMS and PISA, Program for International Assessment of Students by the OECD and the TIMS, Trends in Mathematics and Science Studies. In both uh, international tests, Lebanon, uh, unfortunately, uh, has scored repeatedly and consistently below the, the mean, below the average, and uh, this is really an indication of the weakness of the curriculum in promoting critical thinking, problem solving skills among students. Uh, this in, in turn might affect the voting behavior of students since they are, you know, they are of, of youth, since they might really uh, vote uh, uh, without making sound uh, assessment of their candidates and the projects. This is uh, the first thing. The second one, uh, which is uh, also under the educational, is the narrow space of, uh, for inquiry and uh, deliberation. And I'm now referring to higher education, not the general education sector. Uh, in a study on uh, uh, critical thinking skills, uh, problem solving, meaning, and all under sub subsumed under the uh, uh, pedagogy of inquiry and deliberation, uh, conducted in 15 Arab countries uh, uh, involving 38 institutions of higher education, Lebanon included, we found that the space for dialogue, discussion, and deliberations in, uh, in higher education in Lebanon at the most general level is very weak. And this really uh, does not uh, give us hope or give me hope that the uh, new elections will form a paradigm shift. Uh, uh, in the attitude and the voting behavior among the youth. And the reason being that there is little preparation for civic engagement uh, in, the, um, in the landscape of higher education in Lebanon at the most general level. Uh, I, can, I can somehow safely generalize this based on empirical data that we, we have derived from uh, empirical uh, studies, uh, particularly in the a discourse analysis of what the websites of uh, institutions of higher education in Lebanon tell us. And uh, we analyzed the speech and, of course, we uh, traced uh, several uh, um, uh, keywords uh, that uh, uh, signify pedagogy of inquiry and deliberation, these being critical thinking, problem solving, uh, collaboration, uh, discussion, and deliberation. Um, this is the second one. Therefore, the first one was in, related to general education sector, and the second one was on higher education. Now, the third issue also under subsumed under uh, education is the issue of civic engagement. In civic engagement, um, there is a, a clear uh, uh, emphasis on community service in Lebanon. Uh, this is good. However, there is no emphasis as far as I know, and in my experience, there is no emphasis on uh, service learning that is completely different from community service. Service learning is, is a pedagogy of engagement that really is derived from John Dewey's ideas on, uh, on pedagogy uh, and from uh, also the ideas uh, and the philosophy of Paulo Freire and conscious, uh, consciousness. Uh, uh, so, uh, the, the thing is that we are not engaged in critical thinking through action. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, again, another weakness uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the preparations uh, and the engagement of, um, of youth in the elections, uh, promoting a uh, paradigm shift uh, or a major change in the existing uh, mentality. Uh, now concerning the societal, uh, I think we, uh, we have also identified one important issue, and this, is, uh, uh, this was derived from original research and focus groups uh, with uh, around uh, uh, 300 uh, Lebanese youth um, 
uh, in Lebanon uh, derived or uh, drawn from uh, poverty spots or pockets. And uh, a series of presentations were really uh, presented uh, uh, in the uh, on, on a series of webinars in the Isan Faris Foundation and uh, Institute at AUB uh, in collaboration with the uh, Lebanese Association for Educational Studies. Now, the the main uh, the main theme uh, that was derived from the uh, from this study the, uh, was the the uh, prevalence of the culture of compliance, or uh, they call it in Arabic al intifal uh, of the youth uh, who really uh, succumb their will and their choices uh, to uh, parental authority, uh, to religious institutions, uh, to uh, community uh, uh, groups, and uh, and leaving little space uh, for their own personal initiatives. Uh, this is what we found uh, generally in Lebanon. Uh, and this doesn't mean that there are no uh, youth who really have personal initiative uh, and those who are not really engaged in community action. Uh, no, there are youth who are really believe in change and they are working uh, for change. Uh, but this culture of compliance cannot be eliminated as a factor chiefly responsible for the maintenance and the replication of a system that is obsolete and soon to be defunct. Now, concerning the final point, which is the disposi dispositional uh, factor, and uh, this is the uh, youth uh, propensity uh, to engage in civic action. This is promising. Uh, this is uh, a rekindled hope uh, in the end routes towards uh, toppling the existing uh, obsolete system of confessionalism uh, meshed with parochialism uh, and clientelism and cronyism. And uh, I believe that this is the only sign that I could find uh, uh, in, the, um, in the landscape of uh, conjuring up what will happen, will happen in the forthcoming elections. I hope that the forthcoming elections and the role of youth in that, in that election will not be a uh, hop on and off bus taking the same tourists from one station to another. I, uh, I thank you very much for the uh, for your patience and for listening. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Abujdid, for these uh, insightful uh, ideas. Uh, we will move to the media lens with Dr. Christy Madi. Uh, Dr. Madi. Hello, and uh, I would like you to thank you all for being here, for the chance to be here. It's a pleasure. And uh, I have to agree with the discussant. We, we do need re-education when it comes to our rights as, as citizens. And we definitely uh, need a feminist approach to policy and action. I actually am a strong believer that, that a feminist approach will lead to positive change. And with that, I, I will move to actually uh, what's, what's happening in, in Lebanon. We know that and I will take it from a media lens. We know that Lebanon has been going through a number of drastic changes. Uh, in fact, the past three years have been years of ongoing and unexpected transformation. The series, there have been a series of traumatic events. The August 4 explosion, which took away the lives of over 200 people. Uh, the economic collapse that has left 83% of all people in dimensional poverty, both of which have not been investigated. So our officials continue to escape accountability, offer no action whatsoever, no resolutions, no solutions, leaving the Lebanese people in what I would like to call a liminal space, a nauseating transition. And they are left hoping that the upcoming May elections bring this transition to some form, to, to a shape. We don't know what that shape is, but, but to a shape. So. In the meantime, the, the main question is who gets to tell the story? Who gets to narrate what is happening and who controls the media discourse around the elections and what is happening in the country? Well, I think these conditions of, of liminality or of transition have been in the case of Lebanon necessary for the formation of dissenting voices, whether they're feminist or not feminist, but dissenting voices mainly also on social media platforms. These voices, generated by organizations or by individuals for multi-dimensional pluralistic discourse that could be, that could be empowering. 
So why is this liminal or transitional phase important? Well, it is important because Lebanon has a hybrid political system. And this hybrid political system combines democratic and authoritarian practices. So there's a, there's a complex flux of leeway and control when it comes to the media politics nexus. Of course, Lebanon's mainstream media is mainly in the hands of the political elites. The country's television stations, for instance, are owned directly or indirectly by the main political parties that are also represented, unfortunately, in the government. The main purpose of this political elite is to ensure its continuity, to perpetuate itself. And to do so within this democratic authoritarian hybrid system, they have to tolerate two main uncertainties. The first uncertainty is the institutional uncertainty, which occurs because of elections. And the second uncertainty is informational uncertainty, which results from the opening up of public discourse and debate. Now, when the state is strong, these uncertainties are kept under control and generally result in the re-election of the ruling class. Now, at this point in time, and, and fortunately for us, the Lebanese state has very little control over both uncertainties. To prove its commitment to the democratic rule, it is forced to tolerate the institutional uncertainty and hold elections. But it is fully aware that the level of trust in the current political system is at an all-time low. After all, the October 19 uprising caused a minor tear in the system that reproduced the political elite. And this minor tear turned into full rupture with the August 4 explosion. And this has led to the, to the rise of an unprecedented number of political parties, many of which are promoting new faces, new blood, and making the institutional uncertainty difficult to control. Moving to the second uncertainty, which is the informational uncertainty, that is found in the many pluralistic discourses that have emerged in alternative media spaces thanks to these newly emerging parties. Of course, the state wants to silence these voices, but instead of doing so directly and applying what we can call naked repression, the regime resorts to indirect mechanisms, like the use of the law by filing, for instance, defamation and, and libel lawsuits, which, which we hear every now and then across our media. So the main question here is, what, is, what good is the alternative? media. If the regime is answering back with its own mainstream discourse, defamation lawsuits, and lack of transparency and access, what good is alternative media? Well, first, alternative media cannot be easily controlled. And the new political parties, advocacy organizations, politically aware individuals are using that space, especially since they don't have much access to mainstream media, to fill the void left by government inaction. And they are offering new roadmaps, propositions in an attempt to inform, reform, and perhaps succeed, and I emphasize perhaps, succeed where the state has failed. Um, the huge influx of information generated by these actors on social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, often on daily basis, exponentially multiplies the information, informational uncertainty that the state has to deal with, and of course makes it impossible for the state to control. Uh, of course, you know, there is strength in numbers. Now, second, what's happening on social media? The second thing is on social media, we have a reclaiming of the discourse. So other than being a welcoming space, social media pages have become a space of active, never ending daily conversations on national, political, economic, legal, and social happenings. In this vibrantly active public sphere, there's a multiplicity of interacting voices experts, citizens, candidates, civil society organizations, expats, virtually everyone can be part of the conversation. These multiple voices contest the mainstream media's power over meaning and reclaim the discourse and the right to describe, assess, criticize, and name. This leads to the destabilization of the one voice, in this case, the mainstream political voice in favor of, of the many. Third, there is a formation of an actual public sphere. How is that? Because these many voices are actually creating an information rich environment. And this can lead to hopefully the creation of informed citizenship, which, which is necessary for democracy. And this informed citizenship would become critically more aware of its rights, responsibilities, and the importance of accountability, which we currently don't have. 
uh, people are seeking out alternative media platforms like Daraj, Megaphone, uh, Legal Agenda, the, Lib the Lebanese Depositors Union, and many others to get informed about public news. Many simply are exposed to this news from social media pages. Others actually follow experts like, uh, I'm sure you've heard of some of the names, uh, Dan Azze, Omar Tamo, Nizar Sariye, um, Jessica Abed, and, and many others that are not within the political body. So the, these are being heard on social media and they offer valuable information, they spread awareness, they engage in online discussions. Um, the latest discussion, and I think it, it was mentioned by one of the discussants was, uh, you know, the municipal elections because these might get canceled. And there was a, a, a big discussion around the implications of the cancellation of this municipal discussion, right? Uh, fourth, social media sites have become sites of active criticism and engagement. If anything, the October 19 uprising has helped break the taboo and the halo around political elite. Social media posts are openly critical of the state's politicians, bankers, and economists, as well as the main political actors that run the backroom politics in the country. Lebanese political system, our system, may have made it difficult to hold the elite accountable, but guess what? It did not protect them from the slew of criticism, shame, and accountability that they are being subjected to on social media. And I'm glad about that. So besides being critical, social media experts often offer tangible and workable solutions to Lebanon's multiple crises. Fifth, social media platforms form sites of resistance and togetherness. Besides resisting the state narrative, social media activists and the communities they formed have the capacity to mobilize and safeguard their own. Uh, news of arrests, smear campaigns, lawsuits are immediately spread and they are acted upon. This togetherness has helped heal the many rifts that exist between Lebanese people from different sectarian and political affiliations. If you read the comments on any social media posts, you will see how Lebanese people from different affiliations, different religious and political backgrounds, whether they are discussing in a positive or a negative way, but they are discussing, sharing, arguing, reposting, agreeing and disagreeing on cert certain issues. In many cases, these people have actually formed communities and these communities have transcended the actual community divisions and in many ways uh, they have healed them. Now, you may think I'm being very positive, and maybe I am. <laughs> However, there's a downside to this. Um, you know, just as we see the positive voices, uh, or as, just as there are positive voices on alternative media, there's also a lot of disinformation. We cannot disregard that. There is also misinformation. There is hate speech. And perhaps uh, the starkest examples that I can bring up are the attempts at delegitimizing the October 19 uprising, uh, the pre and post assassination, the hate posts on, on Lokman Slim, you know, uh, the posts on his assassination, pre and post, uh, the jeopardizing of uh, Judge Tariq Bitar, who was appointed to investigate the Beirut post, and as one of the discussants uh, uh, mentioned also, character assassinations, you know, continuously. Um, so studies around this actually reveal that there is a network cluster of actors that are engaged in spreading hate and disinformation as part of a deliberate and well thought out communication strategy. This disinformation, which is spread by online armies, can be damaging to the democratic process and it can in inflame sectarian and communal tensions and reduce trust in the media. Actually, we find that a lot of people are suspicious of the media, whether traditional or online media. And express the fear that this media is manipulated and lacks credibility. The lack of trust, of course, comes from actual manipulation, but also from the massive influx of information. It's not easy to handle so much information coming our way. And, and the big question here that, that we need to ask is who and what to trust, you know, and how can we trust? So regaining that trust, this is a major issue. Uh, why? Because we are talking at the time when the Lebanese no longer trust the democratic process, the just implementation of the law, or even the actual validity of the media as an agent of, of change. So where, where does this uh, leave us? I think that despite the negatives, the plural online conversation is a reflection of a public sphere that is alive and well. 
The powers that be may have successfully controlled the conversation on mainstream media channels, but they cannot, no matter how hard they try, control the vast space of the internet and the loudness of the voices that exists within it. Excuse me, but I wanna quote Foucault who says, if, as Foucault says, power is anything that tends to render immobile and untouchable those things that are offered to us as real, true, as good, you know, so then the online conversation has broken the halo around the power by questioning what it proposes as real, true, and good. And it is leading to an actual resistance through refusal, curiosity, and innovation. People are refusing. They are curiously seeking out new and innovative solutions. So the success of a people's uprising does not happen overnight. And it may not happen in the upcoming elections, uh, as Dr. Abushdeed said, but through refusal, curiosity, and innovation, social media activists, communities, and people are re-educating, informing, and reformulating thought processes that are challenging long existing mindsets and reshaping them for a healthier Lebanon. So do I have hope? Yes, we may not see it in the upcoming election, but there is hope and, and it starts here with this form of resistance. Um, thank you. Uh, very positive, Dr. Madi. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will have uh, a combination of history, political science, and activism with Mr. Nadim al -Kalk. Nadim, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me, and thank you for everyone's uh, great intervention so far. Um, I look forward to this discussion, and maybe then we can engage a bit with uh, uh, the perspectives that everyone shared. Um, what I wanted to come in here talking about initially when I was approached to participate was the more boycott side of the elections debate. And that's a very controversial perspective. A lot of criticisms come up about it. What can you really achieve from a boycott? Uh, what are the prerequisites for a boycott to be effective? And is it too late to organize a boycott? And I felt like in order for me to make my point I really need to go back and look at the very brief history of this anti-establishment movement to identify some of the trends, the characteristics, the features of this very nuanced and growing landscape. Because we tend to talk about anti-establishment groups or, or those alternative groups as this like homogenous entity. And those nuances are often lost because we don't really have like, these groups don't post everything they do. We don't know every everything about their internal meetings. So um, for the past, like, four years, this is what I've been doing research on, the campaigns, the groups, the shifts, uh, the policy stances, the strategies, the involvement of these organizational structures, uh, the types of narratives and discourses that take place in those meeting rooms, and what are the different opposing ideologies that come into friction? How do you develop a coherent program? And what happens when you lack this ideological backbone? Uh, what allows certain groups to, you know, survive these things? Because we've seen a lot of groups emerge over the years that then fell apart. Others were able to develop their organizational structures and then become much more uh, firm in their operations. So I guess like one can trace the start of this new movement to different dates. Some people would say 2011 when the first wave of the Arab uprising started and we had some protests here that were then followed by a lot of organizing leading up to the 2013 elections with the take back parliament movement and so on. Others trace it to 2015 when there was the garbage protests and that's when a lot of groups and activists met and then that led to the campaigns in the 2016 municipal elections and then in the 2018 parliamentary elections. Um, after the 2018 elections, there was a lot of disappointment because in 2016, you had Beirut Madinati that came in. They won nearly 40% of votes in Beirut. And if it was not a majoritarian system, they would have had much more seats. So going into 2018, a lot of groups suddenly popped up because it felt like, oh, there was an opportunity to actually break through. And it was a horrible experience for them. I mean, ultimately, it was just one seat that they won. And the seat was won by uh, one of the more uh, well-known public uh, um, candidates that had a presence in mainstream media. So that was more of a recognizable candidate, not someone that had 
um, come out, out of nowhere, I would say. And it was in the Beirut one district where it's much easier to win a seat because of the uh, threshold needed to, to obtain a seat. But there was some a lot of things that were positive from this experience. A lot of people, as Dr. Mahdi talked about, understand that political transformation and political change is a process and there are different junctures along this path. Um, so from there, um, a lot of the groups that didn't win in 2018 consolidated their organizational structures, drafted real programs, because the main criticism about those groups is that you were only emerging right before elections. These were electoral campaigns, not political parties that had a program and then decided to run. So there was a lot of accusations of opportunism within those groups. So they needed to like somewhat address this criticism and the general perception that these were upper middle class groups that didn't really work on the ground uh, and so on. The, the usual stuff that comes when you have like generally technocratic um, figures that come to the scene and uh, present themselves as candidates. So in 2019, you had a bunch of groups, this landscape, and then new groups emerged. And I think this is where those groups started forming their political identities. So here, I think a very useful way of distinguishing between those groups is thinking that there's two different, um, the two different questions that these groups need to answer. One pertains to their programs and their policies, and the other one is the strategies. How are they gonna go about reaching their objective? On the policy side, after numerous studies that I've conducted, I think that conceptually speaking, most of those groups are center left when it comes to social policy. They're progressive when it comes to those issues. They very much stand out from traditional political parties, uh, as has been discussed uh, when it comes to uh, you know, the rights of uh, sexual and gender minorities or the rights of women or all of these, the, the uh, abolishing the sectarian system, having a compulsory personal status code rather than an optional one. Generally, there's consensus over these issues. When it comes to the economy, everything like falls apart because really I think the elephant in the room is capitalism. And I think that they have completely different understandings of what the nature of this crisis is. Is this something, something really structural and systemic? Or is this something about having non-corrupt people in there to clean the system from the inside? And with that perspective in mind, you end up seeing a shift when it comes to, uh, uh, like a, uh, a difference in policies between those that are more on the center right of the political spectrum when it comes to the economy. They generally favor solutions that somewhat protect the interests of the financial sector while at the same time holding them accountable to a certain extent. These are the groups that favor targeted social assistance schemes rather than universal social protection, or want to privatize some state assets to cover a portion of the financial sector losses instead of having the whole high earners, high depositors, and banks bear the burden of, of those costs. Um, on the other hand, you have the ones that are more center left. And I need to, you know, like accentuate the word center left because these are not like you know marxist radical leftists like the these groups are like still reformists trying to participate in elections uh, to take power through a transitional government so although a lot of groups get called communists or whatever those words are they're not not that i i would love to have you know more radical leftist groups in lebanon but this is more of me talking with my research researcher hat on this doesn't mean that these are groups presenting radical policy proposals they're really looking at you know more social democracies and the west and trying to uh, reach that kind of imaginary for the state and so i think that pushing back a little bit on the like the, the argument of Dr. Maudi about the state of the uh, opposition movement, I think there is an internal crisis, not only in Lebanon's opposition movement, but in movements that are trying to affect change all over the world. Because we're seeing that the counter-revolutionary effort, its mechanisms, its global mechanisms are becoming very redundant and similar across different contexts. And they are very effective, not only in using traditional tools like violent repression and co-optation like these have been in the toolbox for very long there are much new tools that are much more effective in ruining movements whether by infiltrating them from within using media disinformation all of those different things and 
groups that are trying to effect radical change have not been able to find an effective formula to combat that. And that's no fault of their own. What they're going up against is really a mammoth of a system that has much more advanced, advanced technologies, resources, and so on to resist it. But that doesn't mean that we can't have um, to criticize how those groups are operating or the types of strategies that they may be adopting or not. And I think this is where, um, looking at the elections, I think this was a missed opportunity to show political maturity because these groups participated in the 2018 elections. They know how the system works. They were part of a revolutionary uprising that brandished radical slogans, radical feminist demands, internationalist solidarities, a lot of very like typically leftist uh, ideals. And I mean, the whole concept of an uprising and a revolution, whatever anyone might tell me, is um, originates from the left in that sense. So one can't but deny that these slogans, these um, um, these messages, this discourse that was adopted didn't have like a leftist element to them. So when you transition away from this and you look at these elections, the alliances that we're seeing emerge are a complete mess. There are contradictions everywhere in the elections that are, right today, I heard that the Kate'i party, a center-right, mostly Christian, sectarian Christian party is allying with the Jamia al Islamiyah, the Islamic, uh, an Islamist party and Takaddum, which is an opposition group. So like these three completely different profiles are running together. Meanwhile, you have the National Bloc, which, is, which was founded in 1946, but then had a complete restructuring in 2019. And for a very long time, it wasn't clear what their stance was towards, uh, you know, the more contentious opposition figures like the Kata'ib and the independence movement. And now we know that they're actually running with them in some districts, but against them in other districts. So that's exactly what the Kata'ib did to the Lebanese forces in 2018, where like, so these groups that are claiming to do things differently are playing the elections game rather than trying to do this in a different approach. And I don't mean to paint all of these groups as the same because there are distinctions and there are a lot of campaigns that are taking place that are trying to do these things differently, but there's still a minority if you look at the overall number of campaigns. So groups like, you know, Lihaki or Beirut to Kawim, Beirut to Kawim, we're running, uh, it's a new campaign, a lot of uh, student groups and uh, student, the student movement is very involved with this campaign. Uh, Lihaki and the Shuf and Alay, um, these are groups and activists and organizers that have been around for a while and that are trying to run a grassroots-based participatory campaign that's very principles-driven and policy-driven, that stands with more, you know, re redistributive and progressive demands. Um, they are trying, they have a certain different approach to doing things, and they're not the only ones, but these are just two examples that I'm listing. Meanwhile, there's a third approach, and that's that of uh, or citizens in a state that are led by Sharb um, al-Nahas. And what they're doing, instead of saying that, like, because they have been against the elections the whole time, they were very close to boycotting the elections, and then they decided to run anyways. And their goal was that what matters right now is a policy program. What's your program? What's, how are, what are you practically going to do if you are able to enter this government or this parliament or whatever? And so they are running a campaign that's not, that's not candidate driven. They, are, they have fielded, like I think they're fielding more than 50 candidates across the country. It doesn't matter who they are. That's what they're trying to tell you, that the faces or those names don't matter. Everyone is carrying the same program and they have the same plan and it's available online and there is substance to back their, uh, um, to trust them basically. And that this is not an empty blank promise brandishing populist slogans that everyone can use those populist slogans, whether it's the traditional parties or the alternative groups. It's how can you back up uh, your rhetoric with actual arguments. And so um, from there, I'd raise the question, what could an active boycott have accomplished? Right now, the active boycott has completely, is completely useless because it's too late. But instead, if you know that you're going into these elections and you don't have an opportunity to win more than a handful of seats, or let's say 10 seats at most, 10 out of 120 something, um, knowing that these are your limitations and that once you're inside the walls of parliament, your ability to 
affect anything is close to zero. All you can do is really have an eye in there or an ear. And it's very difficult to actually get any legislation across, not only because they have a minority, but also because that's not how decisions are made in Lebanon's political system. It's not the parliament that makes them. It's, you know, the warlords and the sectarian traditional mafia and their like, you know, little spooky room. Like you can think about them like the movies, this little room of like, you know, people running the world. It's exactly like that. <laughs> like, so, so that's, so ultimately the ability to change anything from within is so limited. And instead, you could have had an active boycott movement, not meaning sitting out and doing nothing, but instead going to the streets, having a campaign, having a program, but not listing candidates, not forming lists, not falling in you know, the limitations and the games that this system has created. And when you fall into them, it becomes a disaster. Now you have so much hatred amongst groups because of the elections. Group, like People start hating each other because they're engaging in those games. And ultimately, for what? To lose. Like, the, and this was a chance to prove that we're not gonna go into the same game again, that we went through it in 2018, we had an uprising, we have more experience, we will refuse to be part of this and have instead of an active boycott where we talk to people, where we tell them elections are not an effective tool for political change, but the opposition still exists. There are other tools and alternative ways of resisting the system, whether by founding local councils, neighborhood councils, like they did in Sudan, which was like, you know, the pillar of their uprising and why the Sudanese uprising, which started before ours, is still ongoing until today, despite their challenges. But they had like real grassroots organiza organizational structures that allowed them to maintain the momentum when they were faced by the counter-revolution. We didn't do that properly. Um, we did a great job when it comes to the student elections. There is a lot of effort to expand beyond, you know, private universities and focus on the role of the, of the public university. The same goes to, you know, feminist movements and the environmentalist movement. Like there are, there are always silver linings there and people doing excellent job. But I think we have an internal crisis in imaginaries. We need to, you know, not be afraid to dream, to hope, to dare, and to raise the bar when it comes to those demands. Because that's the, I think, the only way to, you know, fight back the demoralization campaign of the regime, like stripping us of our hope, of our, you know, um, of our ambitions, of what we felt during when we were on the streets of the uprising. This is a tool that the regime is using to, you know, tell us just give up and go away. And instead, we can fight fight that with our imagination. And there's a lot, I mean, theoretically written about. The political imaginaries and how the role that this has and you know uh being the bedrock of a movement from you know uh the role like um the radical the political imagination played in the cuban revolution how different people were able to resist through very hard periods because of you know the, how committed they were to the reality of what a, i mean of a political utopia basically in some sense of the word like what would you ideally ideally want this world to look like when it comes to society, the economy and politics and so on. Um, I think I went uh, a bit too much over time, so I'll end here, but thank you so much. Uh, I can't agree more, uh, Nadim, on the idea of demoralization and this uh, demoralizing uh, efforts. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Honestly, I don't envy my colleague, uh, Dr. Hatem al Hibri, who has to comment on all these extremely insightful interventions. Uh, they are really interdisciplinary. So Hatem, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for giving me such uh, rich material to chew on. Um, I, I disagree, Maria. This is like a, a, a wonderful sort of embarrassment of riches that I get to, um, to comment on. Um, you know, some discussants do this thing where they then give a talk of their own, but borrowing the ideas of the people who came before them. Um, so what I'm going to do is rather than try to summarize all the points that have been made, I'm going to draw out just a couple of threads that lead directly into questions. And these aren't going to be questions for you each individually. I've, I've tried to put together questions that will hopefully get you to talk to each other which I think can be a useful thing that, for a discussion to do. And then of course, hopefully we want time for more pointed questions um, from the audience towards the end. You know, I can't help but uh, have ever present in my mind that we are speaking about an election in the middle of a compounding series of crises that are, ex that are uh, 
profound, perhaps even unprecedented in nature, um, where just so much of one's life and mental space is taken up with just getting by day to day. Um, and this is like, way more true for people living in Lebanon than people like me who are living outside, but I'd say still like half of my brain is taken up with trying to make sense of what's going on from, um, from outside and, and thinking of the people who I love who are there. There's a few ideas which came, which came together for me as I was hearing people talk. Uh, since we're in a crisis, it helps to try to get one's bearings. And I came back to this idea that Saw Joseph gave us uh, back in the 1990s, this idea of connective patriarchy, which, he's, which he describes to say that patriarchy works through family connectivity through which people imagine themselves in relation to uh, um, masculinized leaders. Me and my relationship to the Zayin vis-a-vis the men in my life, right? And this is true of men and women, of course, much less the, the people who are, are neither of those two categories. I'm thinking about the the moment the moments in the uh, these October uh, Revolution, where there seemed to be so much possibility and hope, where everything became possible and nothing was off limits, and the spectacular masculinities which were brought in by the counter revolution to discipline it. When people start to speak in the language of revolution and radical change, you're potentially speaking in the language of what will the regime do with its arms to keep things as they are? They threatened us with civil war and we're like, oh, maybe we don't want to try to get into armed street battles with heavily armed, highly trained, highly funded uh, militias. Um, Nadim ended us on like a, mo a moment of positivity and hope. So I'm gonna to touch on that and then I'm gonna to get to my questions. You know, Nadim, you, you reminded us of how in the Cuban Revolution, um, there was a multi-pronged effort to create a people's uprising, right? To come more immediately to home, you also pointed to Sudan and the political organizing that went in in preparation of what they knew would soon be the counter-revolution in the form of like a military establishment. I also think uh, sort of back in Latin America to Chile, who also had a WhatsApp a, a, a tax hike based protest, but which had a very different outcome, right? Uh, people were willing to directly fight the police, uh, leading to a redrafting of their constitution, right? Not, not that everything is perfect now in Chile, but it had sort of a, by my measure, like a, a more successful outcome than, than what we had. Which brings me to my first question, right? The political sectarianism and its and its forms and its politics depends on patriarchy. It's it's part of its main objective is the maintenance of patriarchy within a, a particular version of a capitalist order, taking different incarnations at different moments. Right? How is it that um, we can think about how might we think about elections as a moment to build generational knowledge? particularly for of uh, a feminist antidote to the sectarian system. How can going, how might elections be a moment of generational learning through going through the process of elections? We're not gonna win this time, but we will learn things which uh, I, uh, the people who will come after us might learn and then be able to win in elections. Second and follow-up question, and again, all of these questions are to everyone, but this first one I, I was sort of thinking of uh, Lina and Kamal in particular. Uh, the second question uh, came to me out of hearing uh, Christy speak about alternative media and spaces online. One of the things which happens in Syria uh, is the state's mobilization of digital tools to more precisely surveil, track, capture dissidents, right? They unblock YouTube at the beginning of the Syrian uprising so that they can see who's posting. And then also, like you, like you mentioned, so disinformation, so generalized distrust. This is the tool of authoritarian regimes in general. It's yes, you want to like censor and kill activists and silence them and make them confess to being a foreign agent in a, in a confessional video, 
but you also want to make it so everything is distrusted. No, who really knows what's going on? It's just a bunch of, of disinformation. But in the case of Lebanon, right, there's sort of like a generalized distrust of the establishment, even by people who see themselves as like party supporters, right? People try to negotiate this cognitive dissonance by saying, yes, it's all corrupt and they're all bad, except for my guy. And then people say, Killon, Yani Killon. And I, I'm, I'm left there with this old insight, which is that there can be governance, there can be a, a, a government with, without consent, without legitimacy, right? But it, it works not because people are convinced that there is no alternative, but because it manufactures a lack of alternatives. Actually, who else, what else do you have? What else is there? What organize, so my question becomes, what organizing capacities are needed to deal with the inevitability of counter-revolution, but also uh, digital forms of repression, right? There's this old uh, thing that Bourdieu once said, which, which is, is like, people are always asking, how might things change? How can things change? And he's like, you know what, nuts to that. I'm interested in how things stay the same. How is it that the regime becomes durable? What is it that needs to change in our imaginaries uh, to make that possible? Last question, then I'll stop talking. What would positive reform look like? So this is very, this is like more concrete and less abstract. What would positive reform look like? And what would radical change need to look like? There's the old leftist critique of becoming involved in uh, liberal democracy leads to a dilution of rad more radical political energies, which would uh, have a more, uh, um, shall I say, antagonistic relationship to the political regime as a whole, which would see elections as one limited tool that would not be interested in a politics of recognize my demands as a good citizen who's demonstrating my worthiness through decency and correct liberal affects, but would instead seek more radical uh, political action. I don't want to grab the soapbox and speak my truth. I want to uh, remain hidden from power when need be. I don't want to convince, I want to win. I'm not trying to send a message, I'm trying to take action in the streets. What would positive reform look like? What would radical change look like? Um, whoever wants to yeah, answer yeah. whatever question, uh, whoever wants to respond to somebody else's response, I'm trying to give you things to stir the pot to talk together. Um, yeah, I, I can um, address that because th this was actually a question that I engaged in uh, in a recent article I wrote for the public source where we were talking about theories of change and what are the different approaches to, you know, transformation. And um, I borrowed on or I drew on uh, late sociologist Eric Olin Wright, uh, his theory of emancipatory theory. Um, and in it, he talks about, you know, needing that a radical change would look like having this ecosystem of uh, disruptive practices where instead of having, you know, um, um, a traditional businesses, you have worker owned businesses and investing more in cooperatives and having, you know, those more socialist types of economies while at the same time, you know, reimagining uh, our conceptions of the family, of patriarchy, of, you know, a lot of things that we take as given and these are the more radical elements. But what he adds to his argument is that for do we, these things to exist and flourish, you all know need, also need to combine it with the more uh, reformist perspective. Uh, and that gets to the second side of your question about what does reform look like? And he says that in his theory, the role of those policy reforms is to help strengthen the ecosystem for those radical alternatives to emerge. So the goal behind those policy reforms is to make it easier for you know, worker-owned businesses to emerge, for those more uh, non-traditional, uh, like more conservative, conservative and traditional institutions and structures to be undone and to be reimagined. And these are the types of more practical dimensions of 
the radical proposal because there is a certain disconnect in this radical proposal if we see it the way the old left used to where it's just like revolutionary rupture where there's suddenly this revolution and everything transforms overnight or at least within a very short period of time instead i align more with a combination of gradualist and rupturalist perspectives where you can make gradual gains and then sometimes have ruptures and other times have you know like drawbacks setbacks and so on um so i think that's um to put it in very broad terms and not getting into specific policies would be the way i uh, would imagine it Uh, Lina? Yes, um, probably also linked to what Nadim was saying, but let me go back to um, uh, Hatem's first uh, uh, question or, or point. I, I certainly agree with you. Uh, uh, first of all, sorry for this very dramatic, uh, 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 I only have the UPS working. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it looks incredibly dramatic now, I, you know, very Hollywoodian. Um, I certainly agree with you, and this is what I was uh, trying to say, you know, how, because that system is by, defini by definition and, and really happily and unapologetically uh, uh, patriarchal, this is what makes it incredibly uh, difficult for women who engage uh, at a municipal level, because there um, you go down to the more basic, uh, basic family. Um, and, and, um, and this is where actually all the social norms are formed, all the, all the social constraints are formed, all the social expectations are formed. And then the more you try to depart from it, the more you go into this, um, and it's so typically and viciously patriarchal, which is the character assassination, uh, uh, you know, the fact that if you, if, you, if you don't abide by that patriarchal system, you're definitely a slut, uh, uh, this, that, or, uh, you know, um, and, you know, um, um, and also the slut by the way patriarchy defines, you know, the way patriarchy, patriarchy thinks this is a departure from, uh, from gender norms. So, and if I want to see, you know, for me, what would, what is it that, uh, uh, what is it that would make me uh, uh, comfortable with, uh, with, uh, with newcomers? Um, first of all, um, I'm, you know, I'm comfortable with the, with the, with an agenda that calls out patriarchy, with an agenda that calls out uh, uh, religious, uh, uh, which, which calls out the clergy. You know, some of the women who are actually out there um, have spoken out, uh, you know, um, uh, very bluntly uh, against the, uh, um, you know, the cases of the, where the church is, uh, uh, um, uh, is defending a rapist, a well-known, a well-known condemned rapist, where, where the church has a lot to, to answer in terms of abuses, uh, in terms of, of abuses, many of which are of sexual uh, nature. I think, it doesn't mean that we're 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 going to end uh, these uh, terribly violent and terribly patriarchal institutions uh, overnight. But I think, um, and you know, at my age, you can see the difference, you can see the trends, and you can see the change in conversation. The conversations that we are having having now, the conversation around at Two, uh, uh, two members of the clergy, one is six feet under and one is six uh, is, is still alive, who are being exposed as rapists is actually new. I have to say this, we wouldn't be having this conversation uh, uh, a decade ago. Nobody would even dare of calling uh, 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 a holy, a quote unquote, a holy man, a, a rapist. And I think we owe this uh, to, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm taking too long, but we owe this to uh, uh, to decades and decades of of feminists putting themselves out there and calling out on religious institutions and and, and women who have been themselves survivors of violence by uh, uh, members of the of the of the clergy, whatever clergy it is, being out there and exposing this. 
Is this um, a, a very long process? Of course it is. As we are speaking, these abuses continue, continue to happen. But what changed, what, what a significant change for, uh, uh, for me means is actually uh, having these discussions as part of any political, uh, as a part of any political forum of this being called out and these demands for dis disrupting, if not destroying these uh, uh, institutions uh, within 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 the assembly. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kamal. Would you like to uh, comment on the multiple questions of uh, Hatem? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Hatem, for the uh, for the questions. They are very stimulating, indeed. Um, I believe that uh, that Lebanese, uh, and sorry for this uh, hortatory <laughs> statement, uh, we all need to re-socialize into the dynamics of, uh, of citizenship. And uh, by citizenship, I, I take the approach of Paulo Freire, uh, emancipatory education. Uh, the breaking down of the banking system of education that centers on the uh, on the teacher and creates a, uh, uh, a, a a relationship between the uh, the a negative relationship between the uh, despot and uh, his or her subjects uh, a an educational system that is based on dialogue on is based on circles of dialogue of debate uh, of uh, um, a discussion that would really uh, at the end of the day help uh, change the status quo uh, otherwise uh, i think uh, uh, we won't have really positive uh, change as we desire to have positive change uh, or the positive change that we would like to see happening. Mm? Uh, so I give you a couple of examples uh, uh, of the uh, liberation pedagogy or critical consciousness. Uh, when, when Paulo Freire really uh, started his uh, radical ideas uh, in Brazil, he was imprisoned. But his uh, praxis uh, of liberation uh, pedagogy, liberation education, was implemented in the ex-colonial, uh, 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 ex-colony of Brazil, Guinea-Bissau, and uh, they were able to liberate. There were some episodes of similar happenings uh, uh, in the uh, in the region here uh, of the Middle East and North Africa. I mentioned. Uh, 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 Egypt uh, during the revolution um, when Mubarak was toppled there were uh, circles of dialogue and groups that were really studying reading and reflecting on uh, Paulo Freire pedagogy of the oppressed and with Macedo uh, literacy reading the world and the world and also um, the discourse of Rancier uh, the ignorant schoolmaster all this really helped to uh, bring in a new fresh air into the uh, thinking uh, of the of the youth uh, uh, in, in Egypt. Now we don't know the extent to which these attempts, uh, you know, succeeded. Um, we don't know; these are yet to be measured. But uh, we have really some uh, some uh, limitations here, and I'm not saying these limitations or repeating them to dishearten uh, to dishearten us from uh, instigating positive change in, in Lebanon and topple the existing uh, system of, uh, of confessionalism, which is the yeast of Lebanon's uh, predicament. Uh, I, I recall uh, the title of the book by uh, Nakhli Wehbi, uh, uh, grand, grand Sons Without Grandfathers. This is uh, a strong uh, indication of the uh, lack of uh, of belief in a history, a unified history of Lebanon, uh, with the uh, different interpretations pertaining to to the country. 
uh, I think we need to have uh, also, uh, in my experience, a, a modicum, at least, uh, of um, a modicum of resocializing into a commonly agreed upon national unitary uh, aspects of uh, of the history of Lebanon, and start to uh, you know to reimagine a, a new Lebanon that really will accommodate uh, and meet the aspirations of the generations to come. Uh, my son, uh, I, uh, Dr. Maria knows, traveled, doesn't want to, uh, to come back. Uh, he was really very frustrated in Lebanon. He felt the, and his name is Nadim, uh, very frustrated with the system and he found that he really could do little uh, to uh, alter and change the uh, the status quo that uh, we are under. Uh, hundreds, hundreds of Lebanese, as you know, are uh, immigrating, leaving the country. Uh, in our registrar, we see students going to go to asking for uh, their transcripts and so on in order to uh, pack and leave. These are really very saddening. And uh, we need to do something about that. And uh, in my opinion, uh, the starting premise uh, for a solid, sustainable and, and uh, change of a due and uh, discernible process would start really with the educational system. Uh, I can tell you that I personally have suffered from the, uh, the curriculum, not from the intended curriculum that is content-based already, uh, but I suffered from the two, two types of curricula, the uh, hidden uh, curricula, curriculum and the, and the parallel curriculum. And by the parallel curriculum, I mean those symbols, you know, uh, that are in school that favor one group at the expense of the, of the other and so on with this kind of subtle indoctrination. Uh, that is really uh, unhealthy as an antithesis and is anathema to democracy. Uh, the second one uh, is the, uh, uh, the heading curriculum where we used to receive, uh, to be taught two different sessions of history. Uh, the first session is to study for the national exams and the second session of the same lesson to have the uh, interpretation uh, of the uh, of the of that confessional community or confessional group, and this was really very uh, uh, very bad for uh, for me and for uh, my colleagues and uh, my you know fellow students, uh, and we really uh, um, uh, really very sad to to talk about this uh, episode. Uh, overall, uh, I think that uh, now, uh, since the uh, uh, Center for Education Research uh, and Development and Dr. Maria knows under the auspices of the World Bank and the UNESCO, uh, they are trying to uh, come up with the national curriculum for Lebanon. Um, and I hope they will succeed in uh, making a serious gravitation from the content-based to the competency-based curriculum that really will give students uh, the opportunity to be able uh, to become agents of change in the long run. Uh, but uh, personally, I'm very doubtful uh, about successes uh, of the uh, uh, new curriculum in my experience as a also member in the committee of planning. Uh, sorry for being uh, uh, for resounding with a negative, but I am trying to be as realistic as possible uh, based on experience, based on research on Lebanon and so on. But again, I'm not dissuading uh, any effort. I'm just predicting for the uh, very near future, the elections that uh, we are least likely to, to see a uh, drastic uh, and uh, a major change in the arena, and I hope that I am wrong. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, you Dr. Kamal, Dr. Madi. I think you should leave the positive to me, Dr. Abushdid. <laughs> exactly. So we will uh, end on a positive note with you, Dr. Madi. Let, let's hope. Uh, actually, Hatim, you've you've asked a lot a lot of questions that are uh, thought provoking and frustrating at the same time. 
how how do you answer those questions uh, while keeping in mind you know that we have to keep keep hope alive and and uh, you know uh, there is nothing um, that is hopeless in in my opinion you asked how can we think of elections as a moment to build generational learning and i agree with dr kamal abushdi it all starts with with education and re-education uh, i think social media is playing that role right now uh, the active conversations on social media, the give and take, most of it uh, is, is educational, is informational. And, uh, you know, they're changing the discourse. They are teaching people what is it that they should ask about when they want to elect someone, when there are candidates out there. Um, and they're telling candidates, you need to have a program. I need to see your program to elect you. And that, in my opinion, is a huge change. That, that's the start of, of change. So uh, is that a moment of learning? Definitely, yes, yes, it is a moment of learning. How big that moment is, <laughs> that remains to be seen, but it is a moment of learning and it is a start. And yes, we need to start in school. Civic education needs to start in school. And maybe we should start with our history book, which we, we don't have, you know, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, up till this day. So let's start there. And, uh, you know, let's have everyone agree on, on one unified history book. And, and that is a near impossibility. Uh, See, I'm, I'm being hopeless now. So, <laughs> but, but we will get there. Uh, another thing is how do we counter disinformation? Well, uh, disinformation is rampant. Misinformation is, is rampant online. Unfortunately, the distrust in the media is, is at its finest right now. But we do have people that are countering this disinformation online. Um, when I asked, how do we trust what we see there? How do we deal with the overwhelming also amount of information that is out there? Um, I think in a way we also need media literacy, which we teach in our courses. We find that a lot of our media literate students are able to assess and to evaluate the information that, that is out there. So it takes research, it takes digging up the information, it takes not sharing before actually verifying. Uh, this also is a matter of, of education. This is a form of, of countering this misinformation. But we also see that there are many experts online that are countering the misinformation. Yes, it may have spread, but they are also teaching others how to manage that form of misinformation. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I'm trying to go through, you know, uh, what would positive reform and, and radical reform look like? There is no magic solution. It's not going to happen overnight, unfortunately. <laughs> the elections are not going to cut it. It's not. It's not going to happen now. It's not. It might not happen any anytime soon. Uh, yes, we do have to be realistic at one point in time, but we also have to realize that that there is a change. There is a change in our imagination. There is a change in the way we are proposing and approaching solutions. There is a change in the way we are disrupting the the. Uh, I'm going to use Foucault again. You know. Uh, there are micro capillaries of power that are available there every day. And when we disrupt this power bit by bit, day by day, just a little bit, we are making, making a change. Again, you know, the resistance through refusal, through curiosity and, and through innovation, refusal. We are refusing the system. We are refusing what the system is imposing on us. That's step one. We are curious about how we can change it. That's, that's step number two. And we are coming up with solutions. There are solutions that, that people online are suggesting continuously. If, if you follow, um, you know, as I said, Nizar Sari, if you follow Jessica Abe, these are people that, that are not running for elections. What are they doing then? Why, why are they contributing to that discourse? Because this is a discourse that will help eventually uh, build a, a nation. It, it's not going to happen now, but it is changing mindsets and, and it is reshaping them. So um, let, let's hope it, it leads somewhere positive. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madi, also for shedding lights on the importance of media literacy because it's very crucial and it can definitely uh, make a big change in Lebanon. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you all for being with us. I would like to uh, thank you again for your valuable insights and talks. Uh, thank you, Hatem Al Hibri, Nadim Al Qad, Christy Madi, Lina Abu Habib, and Kamal Abu Shdid, and hope to see you soon in more events from Beirut. Thank you.